Hello, and welcome to our second video on low Earth orbiting satellites, LEOs for short. Uh, today, we're going to go over the basics of LEO satellites for folks that are interested uh, because the technology is exploding. Uh, there's going to be thousands of LEOs or constellations deployed in the near future, and the federal government's starting to react. The FCC has established uh, a Space Bureau and International Affairs uh, Office to help tackle some of these policy questions. And so uh, today we are joined by a panel of experts, some of the leading experts that can discuss uh, for a non-technical audience uh, what LEOs are and why they have such a big impact coming. John Piha. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. I've previously served at the Federal Communications Commission as the chief technologist in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and in industry as a CTO. My name is John Barentine. I am an astronomer and principal consultant at Dark Sky Consulting, LLC. And I work on issues of light pollution and satellite interference with astronomy observations. Yeah, my name is Robert Bayerbach. Uh, I've been in the space industry for roughly 30 years, uh, working uh, with all the big satellite operators worldwide. Um, I'm presently present. Uh, I'm president of uh, Maritime Launch Services in Washington, D.C. is the affiliate of uh, Canadian Spaceport that we're building in Nova Scotia right now that we've got fully licensed to start construction. And I'm also CEO of, uh, of a new aerospace startup uh, called Zero G Launch. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm Michael O'Reilly. I have my own consulting firm, but prior to that, I spent seven years as an FCC commissioner. And before that, I had a long career uh, as a policymaker on Capitol Hill as a staff in the U.S. Senate and on the U.S. House of Representatives. Satellites are a valuable communications method, um, particularly if you want to go you know, across an ocean. They provide us navigation capabilities. I couldn't find my way you know, to my neighbor now without GPS. Uh, they provide um, ability to monitor the Earth, to predict Earth uh, hurricanes and weather prediction. They provide timing information that makes all sorts of infrastructure work, like our power grids. Satellites are so important for the daily lives of Americans and globally. Uh, they in the, both the commercial side and the non-commercial side, from de depicting weather um, and, and, and analyzing uh, different uh, data points that are put forward for, for terrain and to, uh, topography and all kinds of measurements that are used on the non-commercial side. And then on the commercial side, we use them for video, we use them for broadband, we use them for, for voice uh, telephony. Um, they're so vital that, that uh, into the daily lives that, that people may not realize. There are two main categories. Of course, there are more, but there are two main categories of satellites. Uh, the LEO is the low Earth orbit satellites that are typically around anywhere from 500 kilometers, 400 kilometers to uh, a couple thousand kilometers of altitude. Uh, the much larger and much uh, older technology satellites are called the geostationary satellites, the geos. And those are in 36,000 kilometers, much, much further away. Naturally, they orbit the Earth uh, uh, much slower than the LEO satellites. So LEO satellites are smaller in size, they obviously rotate the Earth much, much quicker, but they can revisit the Earth on a very, very uh, um, a repeated basis, roughly every 90 minutes or so. So you, when you build a, a, a LEO satellite to do something for you, uh, to commu for communications or for internet or for even uh, uh, Earth observation, you have to typically launch several satellites to build what we call a small constellation to give you the equivalent coverage that you would have from a further away satellite, a geosatellite, that is more of a school bus satellite, a school bus size satellite that remains stationary vis-a-vis -vis the rotation of the Earth. So you don't have to move your antennas or you don't have to be tracking it. So that's the main difference is size and the mass of the satellites. And obviously the amount of satellites you have to put together 
to give that service and provide a service to the, to the customer. Well, we're going to see them in all kinds of life, um, our daily life activities. You know, right now, they're mostly being used or they're trying to develop the, the marketplace for broadband communications, but that gets into all different other things, whether it be delivery of video, delivery of voice, all kind of go into that cornucopia of services because of their, um, because of their capabilities and the capacity, um, they're able to provide new communications that weren't, that weren't ever available in a lot of locations, whether it be in the United States or globally. The uh, efficacy of, of doing satellite broadband uh, from LEO varies a bit depending upon the details and the service provider. Our main point of reference right now, that the only extensive broadband network in LEO is the SpaceX Starlink constellation, which now has a few thousand satellites. It is, I would say, competitive with ground-based broadband through sources like uh, wireless 5G communications or optical fiber, but it can't quite achieve the same sort of speeds we can get on the ground. So I think the target for this kind of application nowadays is people who live generally in more rural or isolated areas where a wireless option or fiber uh, really isn't there yet. But if you live in a city, at least right now, it's hard to imagine that the speeds that satellites in LEO can achieve would really be competitive with those more terrestrial means of serving internet. Leo's come in all shapes and sizes. In fact, they can be as small as a as a shoebox. Let's say that's what we call roughly a, a three U satellite. And those could be built uh, almost in your garage. Uh, a lot of uh, those are the types of satellites that are built by universities, for example, uh, when the, uh, uh, students in aerospace are building their very, very first units to to test and launch into space. And then they can go to to sizes that are more commonly around the you know uh, uh, dorm refrigerator size or a little bit bigger than that. And those will be much more capable. Have larger batteries. They will have so. Those are being built by several companies uh, around the world. I would say two thirds of all satellites are uh, being built in the United States by a couple hundred companies now uh, that have joined the the, the, uh, the Leo space industry because there's so much innovation and it's become cheaper to launch. Uh, uh, and then the I guess the 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 other one third of the satellites are being built around the world in Europe and elsewhere as well. But it really has covered the globe now, and and you see companies that are are not your typical governments that used to launch and build satellites. The, 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 the big growth in our industry today is being propelled by the commercial space industry. And there are thousands of companies today bringing this industry to a billion dollar industry in the next 10 years, or a trillion dollar industry, I'm sorry. The time between uh, fabrication and deployment in space has come down significantly to the point where some operators are looking at, at quite literally only a matter of a few weeks. So we, we go from parts on a bench to a functioning satellite in space uh, in a span of perhaps eight to 10 weeks, which is what is enabling the launch pace to increase at the rate that it has. But of course, that doesn't take into account the run-up time uh, that involves prototyping and testing, which can be several years. But once you enter that mass production phase, uh, the time delay between fabrication and launch is now very short. That's uh, an important uh, aspect of any satellite that you launch in space, but there are differences to, between LEOs and GEOs as well. The LEO satellites are small, as I said, not all of them by regulation are required to have um, any kind of propulsive maneuvering capability. So that means that once they're launched, and they're released by the deployer of the rocket. They're basically just floating in space until slowly but surely they come in and then start degrading their orbits and come and burn up in the atmosphere, depending on the altitudes you're, you're in, of course. But uh, regulatorily, we're not forced to have the operators have those uh, maneuvering capabilities 
which brings some issues there in terms of being able to move out of the way if there's any kind of expected collision with anything else. Most of the operators now are realizing that's not the way to build a satellite. And so they're building some sort of maneuvering capability, be it electric propulsion or be that uh, chemical propulsion to be able to move, maneuver and get out of the way. And at the end of the life to deorbit your, your system as well. But not uh, regulatorily, we're not forced to do that. In the geospace and the geostationary space, however, that is a requirement. You can't get a license to, light, to, to launch a satellite unless you have propulsive uh, capabilities to put it into graveyard orbit at the end of, it, of its life. That's the main difference between the bigger, uh, bigger satellites in geo and, of course, our very, very buoyant activity that's happening in LEO today. But we do, do need a little bit more of uh, rules of the road, I think, to be able to uh, have some requirements there so that it doesn't become the wild west out there. There's definitely um, concern about um, what is the impact of, of of can a fleet you know can satellites collide and what is the 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 ramifications for that? Does it leave debris? Does it does it muddy the field for future launches and other you know other fleets going forward? So absolutely a concern for policymakers. One of the top priorities of 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 the last administration, this administration, trying to figure out how do you balance the right uh, debris policy uh, to make sure that it doesn't interfere with with a dynamic uh, launch and new services. Um, but also make sure that it maintains the capabilities in, in space for not just commercial satellite services, but also uh, exploration and NASA and services along those lines. So any kind of wireless communication, television, cellular, Wi-Fi, and satellites requires uh, use of electromagnetic spectrum. And when multiple systems use the same spectrum, there is a possibility that they will interfere with each other. And the more LEO satellites we're putting up, all of which are, or many of which we're sharing the same spectrum bands, the greater the risk is that they will interfere with each other and that they will interfere with existing systems like geosynchronous satellites. So this is going to be a very important issue going forward particularly as more and more satellite constellations and more and more satellites are put into space. In the, the next few decades, I, I think we are going to see things approach a tipping point very rapidly. And that has to do with uh, the unanswered question of how many LEO satellites can there possibly be? How dense can we pack that space with satellites and the debris that they produce without setting off a, a chain reaction of collisions that generates so much debris that it effectively closes that space? And that's a worry not only for the continued use of LEO, but even being able to move through it. If we want to send humans to the moon, for example, or beyond, they have to transit through the LEO belt. And if the debris is so dense that they can't safely do that, it really changes what the, the near term future use of space might be. So we've got to have a conversation about how to better manage this from a, a sort of traffic perspective. They need to become more autonomous and maneuverable uh, for that reason. And their main competition right now is really from those uh, ground-based broadband networks from uh, 5G and 6G and its future successors in wireless and, and faster optical fiber links on the ground. I think there is room for all of these technologies to coexist. And there's probably even a solution to the debris problem in space. But I also think that that means we're going to have to rethink the way we do a lot of things now and come up with some new approaches or else we're destined to repeat some of the, 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 the history of technology in the past where we really rushed into new technologies before we understood them fully. Mm -hmm.